Hello and welcome to The Sharpening Report. I am your host, Josh Peck. I am so pleased to welcome back once again uh, a very regular guest now, uh, Dr. Ken Johnson. Uh, Ken, how are you doing? Doing real well. How about you? I'm doing great. I have been loving your research, loving your YouTube channel, all your books. I've I bought a lot of them, and I, I highly suggest that people out there, my, my audience, go and get them too. Um, absolutely phenomenal work. And I'm really excited to talk about the... Uh, pre-tribulation rapture today, and I just got something in my eye. So to start us off here while I take care of this, um, can you uh, briefly explain your position uh, on the rapture? And I know we're going to be getting into specifics throughout the interview, but what are some of the broader points on uh, why you believe that your position is the correct one of the three or four available uh, to Christians today? Okay, yeah, I am a pre-tribulational rapturist which means I believe uh, in the premillennial view also. Uh, and basically that is that the Lord's coming back sometime in the future, and there's going to be, as it says, a thousand-year reign of him on earth. And we believe that to be literal, not symbolic. And there is a seven-year tribulation period mentioned in Daniel that uh, where the Antichrist rules, and the Antichrist would is basically undefeated or can't be defeated by humans. So he his defeat is when the Lord comes back. So we know that the seven-year tribulation period ends with the second coming. So that's sometime in the future that we believe. And then there's this rapture that's talked about in 1 Thessalonians 4. And the uh, question is, is it uh, before the tribulation begins, just sometime before, or right at the beginning, or in the middle, or sometime in the middle, or at the end? And there's different views on that. And uh, I take the uh, pre-tribulational rapture view— I think it's the most logical when you look at uh, things like 2 Thessalonians 2, which I know is argued a lot about, but also uh, uh, Old Testament scriptures like um, uh, Daniel chapter 12, and also Dead Sea Scrolls like Enoch and a few of the others. They seem to be all that together, or any one of those, seems to paint a very clear picture on the timing. Yeah, definitely. And this is and I agree with you too. I'm I'm the same premillennial pre-trib rapture uh futurist, you know, uh dispensationalist all that stuff. And it, it's funny because I was raised that way uh in the Baptist church and then when I got a little older, kind of in my young adulthood years, I sort of fell away from the church. I never denied Jesus, but I got into like new age kind of stuff and when I came back into uh into the church, and denounced all the new age garbage. Um, I started to look more into this, the you know, the rapture idea because I, I always loved end time prophecy when I was a kid, especially the rapture. Loved all that kind of stuff, and then kind of fell away from it. And uh, in my after coming out of new age, there was there was this period where I was just so flat out confused about the rapture because I was learning about all these other positions and all these other interpretations. And it, it really bothered me for a while. I, I took some time in prayer and asked God, you know, show me which is the right one because I don't know. And then it was funny because over the next over the next three or four years um, of my life, I, I went through and there was, there was a time where I believed in each one of the, you know, three or four possibilities that's out there now. And was, was during that time was dead sure that it had to be that one and couldn't be any other. Then there was a, a long period after that where I was like, well, I don't know. I don't know if it can be known. I'm going to lean towards pre-trib because that's what I was raised in. It's, it's the one I'm more familiar with. It's the one that I hope is true. And, you know, maybe the other ones are, but at least let's not divide on it. So I started uh, thinking like that because the church I was raised in, they would divide over uh, rapture belief. So they, they would be the kind of church where they would say, you know, if, if, you're, if you believe in a mid-trib, you're not like really a Christian. Like they were real strict like that. Um, mm. And so at this time in my life, I was at least to the point where I was like, okay, there's still Christians, just, you know, we'll, who knows. But then recently, uh, within the past maybe couple of years or so, uh, it, it really hasn't been long at all. It, it really feels like God finally has given me an answer to that original prayer of, you know, which one is it? Because the pre-trib rapture belief to me now is the one that makes the most sense when you look at everything in context. But there was a lot of things I had to learn about history, uh, a lot of context I needed that I didn't get before. Uh, one of the things that tripped me up that makes sense now, um, there's a couple of things that we are expecting, you know, a rapture and an apostasy. And this was something that kind of threw me for a little while. And it makes sense now, but uh, in your view, are, are these two connected? And how, how do you 
you see these two things playing out, the rapture and the apostasy? Well, there's always, um, we, we look at things as events, uh, like that happens next Tuesday at exactly 3.54 p.m., you know. And we, ha- we have to realize if that was to happen, there's a whole bunch of things that set up for it beforehand. And uh, in the back in the first century A.D., there was a basically 100 to 150 years to prepare for the, this apostasy. It got kept getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And everybody can agree now that uh, the church isn't exactly the way the church was. And so there's a lot of confusion starts with confusion. And then there's a lot of just weird teaching in it. And some people saying they're Christian, but they don't even believe in Christ and things like that. So. The, that's definitely an apostasy. Now, there's a specific apostasy that's mentioned in Second Thessalonians 2 connected with that time period. Um, but yeah, it comes that, comes that way. One of the scrolls talks about how the rapture is uh, to engender repentance. So we, what we can see is the, the apostasy gets worse and worse and worse. And people say, ah, you're one of those wacky Christians. You believe in a pre-trib rapture. Probably believe there was a real flood, too, don't you? You know, just making fun of you and everything. But then one day we disappear, and they realize it wasn't a joke. It was, it was real, and they missed it. And that's part of God's grace, just to use things to get people to think, to try to come back to him. So there has to be an apostasy uh, of growing proportions before the rapture. Do you do you see that kind of playing out today? Because I know there was uh, at the end of the age of Torah, uh, you know, around the time of Christ, there was definitely an apostasy there. And you know, we've talked about before that you know I, I think the apostasy is is more than just the difference in doctrine, but it's like a it's an attitude of if we have a difference, then I have to kill you, or you know, you're not a real Christian, or something like that. And and it, it we definitely saw that at the end of the last stage. Do you think we're gearing up towards that kind of thing happening like within the church or within Christianity uh, in, in the end of our age? I think so. Um, and I think it, that attitude comes and goes. I mean, we had the, the wars between the Protestants and the Catholics, for instance, and now everyone's pretty much at peace. And that may or may not fl- flare up again, but things like that happens. Um, uh, we still have Islam being very um, um, hostile to Christianity. Uh, when it's convenient for them anyway. And, of course, their their holy books actually say they're supposed to. So I, I think so, and I think this is the deal. Um, the Sadducees in the first century got to the point where nobody's good. You're, you're not good for anything, really, unless you're a Sadducee. You've got to be one of ours. They were the super clicky group. And then the Pharisees were like, we love any Jew. We don't like Jews. Gentiles, but we love any Jew, but we really want to convert you to the Pharisee way because everybody else is stupid, you know. And so it's you can see these different degrees. And uh, the Essenes were were totally different. They would, uh, I mean, the priests had to be separate to do their jobs, but the people that followed the teachings, it would be like you're black, you're white, you're a Jew, you're a Gentile, you're a man or a woman. I don't care. Do you do you love the Lord? Do you want to talk about prophecy? Cool. Let's have lunch. And that's what brothers and sisters do, you know, not to say that there's not arguments among us, but we're brothers and sisters. And I think that's the same thing. Like, I think you and I believe in a pre-trib rapture, but if there, if we were wrong and there is a mid-trib or a post-trib or something else, I think everyone that's a believer is going to go whenever it happens. And half of us are going to say, wow, I was wrong, you know? So if we're all going in it and it's a difference of opinion and it's not super important, Why are we arguing so much about it, for instance? And, you know, even that could be somewhat okay because you want to say, you know, I want to teach my position. Mm -hmm. Uh, But you get an argumentative spirit and then you get hostile. And then hostility turns into excommunication for the wrong reasons. And then it's us versus them. And then pretty soon people's feelings get hurt and then people's property gets damaged and then people get injured. And then sometimes people get killed. And it's just this this escalation type thing. And we've got to realize that the scriptures talk about the fact that, I mean, if you're immoral, I'm supposed to excommunicate you. I'm not supposed to kill you because I want you to repent and become a Christian. I mean, it's it's counterproductive. And we don't, I can't convert you when I'm yelling and cussing at you. 
So it's just it it just makes perfect sense that you need to show love. Like it says in Galatians 6, we need to restore people to faith, understanding that if the situation was reversed, we'd be the one be needing some restoration. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I, I can see that in my own life. You know, I, I was lost in that new age deception for, for years. And, you know, if it wasn't for... Uh, good Christians that, that were praying for me and, you know, lovingly pulling me out of that. If, if all it was, was, was Christians just yelling and screaming at me or, or not giving me any chance or, you, you know, just say, okay, well, you're, you're going to die and go to hell and that's you. And we're going to be over here in heaven and, you know, good luck with that. If that was the attitude, I would have never come back to Christianity, you know, who would, uh, but it was through people, it was through Christians being loving, praying with me, showing me what the scripture says, showing me how uh, New Age has many errors in it, but they were doing it in a loving way and actually uh, challenging my own beliefs. I mean, that that's what really pulled me out of it. So, yeah, I, I completely agree with you there. And unfortunately, um, I think the Internet's kind of helped facilitate this whole attitude of we need to yell and shout and, uh, you know, get mad at each other because we can do it anonymously. Um, you mentioned Second uh, Thessalonians uh, 2. And that it seems to, um, yeah, I think it's two through eight, uh, or maybe that's the verses, but it, it seems to lay out this, this simple timeline. So there's first the rapture, then there's the revealing of the Antichrist, then the second coming of, of Jesus. And actually, I have the passage, I can read it, so if people don't have a Bible handy, um, and I'm reading from the New King James here, but uh, yeah, uh, so Second Thessalonians 2, uh, and it's two through eight, but it says, or, or three through eight. Let no one deceive you by any means for that day, meaning, you know, the day that Jesus comes back, the day of the Lord, the, you know, tribulation, all that kind of stuff. That day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that's called God and his worship. Okay, so that's obviously the Antichrist. And then uh, Paul says, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be uh, revealed. So there, it seems like there's this, there's this uh, uh, restraining thing. And this makes sense knowing that the restrainer, knowing what it is and what it does, that it's holding back the Antichrist, that the restrainer itself is the Holy Spirit, which I remember when I was growing up, everybody kind of wondered what the restrainer was and didn't really know. But there, there's actually a way that we can know. Uh, and the church fathers give us some information about that. So can you tell us about how the church fathers would talk about how like a, a Holy Spirit filled Christian just being in like a pagan temple or something that it would like ruin their magic and their demonic rituals? Like there's something about the Holy Spirit being in a Christian that if that Christian is around somebody who's trying to practice something demonic, it, it just it doesn't work. Is, is that is that like an example of the restrainer? That's a really good example, I think, to, to pull these together. Yeah, there, there are many texts there where the church fathers talk about that. It usually comes up in, in one of two ways. For instance, there was uh, uh, the Nicolaitans who were a certain cult, even mentioned in Revelation, actually. Uh, but they, they did several weird things. But one of their teachings was that Christians can be demon-possessed. And they would have this ritual of how to cleanse you and all this kind of stuff. And some of it was somewhat pagan ritual. And the whole idea is, you know, you were not supposed to participate in any pagan ritual and Christians don't have to worry about it. And so when that kind of teaching came up, they would kind of explain things. And a lot of them would, would quote stories of things that happened to them. And they would make comments about their basic teaching was that, um, um, any Christian, even a new one, a new believer, um, has the power to cast out demons and stop things. And so uh, you could have been a pagan, you know, this morning, given your heart to Jesus this afternoon. You don't know much about it, but you're filled with the Spirit, and you have some uh, person walking in who's demon-possessed. You can say, in the name of Christ, leave. It leaves. And it was is so powerful, actually, when you have— uh, 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 demonic temples and things that are going on. There's a lot of stories about how the pagans got to the point where they said that if our ritual works, then that means we're kind of by ourselves. And if something messes up again, I bet you there's some stupid Christian walking down the street. 
And they actually believe this. And there was actually even one story the church fathers told about how it was a temple of Zeus uh, in a certain city and, and everything always worked fine. One day it just stopped and nobody could figure out why. And um, so they, they kept researching and, and nobody was a Christian. Everybody still believed and, you know, but they couldn't figure out why. Finally, they figured out one of the guards of, of uh, one of the uh, senators or something became a Christian. And he, he, uh, he was a great, great man with great honor. And he died and they buried him in the, the tombs right outside the temple. So the Caesar, who was still pagan, thought, well, let's do an experiment. Let's dig him up and move him to a different uh, place. They did that. And according to the story, everything started up again working. So just the fact that there's a Christian or bones of a Christian, and I'm not trying to get weird like some of the weird hyper charismatic people do, but we have the example of the bones of Elijah doing something. And it's not us. It's just the Holy Spirit in us. But you've got all of these different um, stories from the first century about how Christians can't be demon possessed. The major problem with a first century Christian is not anything demonic. It's when the pagans realize that you mess their stuff up by simply being around that you get beaten up and killed. So the major problem with the Christians is humans, not not the demonic. And that's an amazing story to have, not just from one church father, but many of them. Yeah, definitely. And w- when I learned that um, and, and learned like how, how the restrainer operates, you know, what, what it is and what it does and, and how it applies to, to our age, it really made that passage click and make sense. And because and it, it's weird, too, because um, it, it also a lot of ancient history that we read about before, you know, like the time of Christ makes sense, too, because it seems like before our age of grace, you know, the enemy had more free reign and that weird magic type of things, you know, those weird rituals, magic types of things. It seems like it's common when you read like ancient stuff. I mean, even from, um, you know, like Janus and Jambres during the time of the plagues against Egypt, you know, they, they were actually able to like learn magic, uh, learn these rituals and make things happen. But you see that in other ancient texts too. So it's not just in the Bible. It's, I mean, basically any um, ancient religious text you look at, it's like it's, it was a totally different world, but we don't really see uh, manifestations like that today uh, too much. And that's um, that has even produced a bunch of atheists now. Uh, is that because, you know, the restrainer, the Holy Spirit is here, so the age of grace is different than the previous two ages? But when that's revealed or when... Um, when, when that's removed, uh, when the restrainer is removed, when, when we're raptured, uh, that there's going to be, could there be another influx of magic and, you know, demonic rituals working again? I mean, even, uh, we, we see that in the, you know, the false prophet's going to have many signs and wonders and the Antichrist, the ascension of Isaiah in the good part of it, uh, the part that, that seems to be reliable. The, the ascension of Isaiah even talks about the Antichrist being able to raise the sun at night and, and the moon during the day and stuff like that. I would was thinking about this if this happens you know like relatively soon the the world this would be the first time the the world the modern world has really seen anything like that that type of magic and so of course they would believe it they would think that that's god so do you think that that's what's going to happen like when we're raptured is that like giving the enemy free reign to do all this kind of uh, weird magic stuff again uh, very well could be. I mean, that seems to indicate we're, we're told that the uh, Antichrist does lying signs and wonders. Right. So and it doesn't mean that they're fake or sleight of hand. They're actually demonic manifestations, the light going on and off or darkness or, or whatever it is. But it's it's done by a satanic power to the uh, for the reason of trying to confuse people. And uh, we see lots of stuff like that. One of the things that's interesting is one of the Dead Sea Scrolls talks about right after the flood, uh, there was so much demonic uh, problem that Noah prayed that God would get rid of the demons because if they appear to people, people just buy it hook, line and sinker. There's this glowing thing over there speaking, you know. And so God basically decided to uh, chain nine-tenths of the demons up in Tartarus and leave one-tenth to tempt people. And so, assumably, we have that one-tenth left that's still in operation today. Well, when you go to the book of Revelation, it talks about the fifth seal, the pit is open, and these locusts come out, which are basically those demons. 
So if you think about it, then whatever kind of a demonic problem we have today, think of what it's going to be when there are 10 times the amount of demons and demonic activity on the planet at that point. So, I mean, there's lots of other texts, you know, that that lead you to believe that stuff. So there's going to be a lot of problems, um, you know, with that. And so, yeah, the restrainer changes things. The Holy Spirit changes things. And we're told that the giving of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost makes everything different because he indwells us in some different way. He indwelt the prophets, but somehow it's just different. And I think it would be almost impossible for us to know exactly what that difference is unless we were back there and then the Holy Spirit came and then we became a Christian and we know both sides. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a really good point about Revelation and and the Holy Spirit. And because even Jesus said that um, it, it's better <laughs> than in, that rather than having you know the resurrected Christ there. Like it, it's it's better that He leave and go to heaven so that the Holy Spirit can come down and be with us. That that that's actually better. And it's it's so strange to think about like. How could that be better than having, you know, Christ in bodily form right with us? But if we think about that, it's it's because he's, I mean, I, I think, like, he's localized, you know, at that point. But if it's the Holy Spirit, then anybody who becomes a Christian, that just spreads out. And it, it really does reshape the world. I mean, even just in a historical context, it totally changes the world. Um, so that, that's amazing to think about. Um, Dan, uh, you talked about Daniel 12 as well, and I had a question about that. Uh, Daniel 12, 1 through 3, uh, says something about these shining ones. And you've said before that that refers to uh, the rapture. And just in case people don't have it open, I'll read it real quick. Uh, from Daniel 12, 1 through 3, again from the New King James, it says, At that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as such as never was since uh, there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to uh, shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine, and uh, like, like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever. So that's, that's the passage about these uh, shining ones. Um, the passage talks about those who are raised to, uh, to also to everlasting contempt. So would this be the, the rapture where living and dead believers are raised, or would this be uh, the resurrection and great white throne judgment, or is it talking about both? Uh, to, like, so to be more specific, if, if this is talking about the rapture, who are the ones that are raised to everlasting contempt? Yeah, I think it's basically trying to explain to you the concept of the raptures. People, people look at, or the resurrections rather, people look at that because the scripture talks about the first resurrection and the second resurrection. Right. And they get confused because because there were some people who were resurrected when Christ was here. So that should be the first one, and we're looking for the second and maybe the third. But we're not going chronologically. There are two different types. Uh, the first resurrection are those resurrected to eternal life, and the second resurrection are those that are resurrected to eternal death, which is you know eternity in hell. And so at this point, he's basically talking about the resurrection, and he's he's reminding you that some are raised to to light and some to eternal damnation. So he's not saying that both of them happen right now this second. But it is interesting, though, because it, it's very clearly the dead are raised in this passage, and then there are these shining ones. And people think like, well, maybe that's brilliant people that can preach the gospel really well. And in context, we're talking about the resurrection rapture. And so remember when Jesus uh, was on the Mount of Transfiguration and Moses and Elijah were there, they were uh, all—the witnesses said they kind of glowed. So they were the shining ones because they were in glorified form. And so we, once we're resurrected or raptured, would be in glorified form, we're told, the glorified body. And Daniel here is just using that as a word. There's actually several words for the rapture in both the scrolls and in the New Testament. It's called the mercy— Uh, You can have mercy in lots of different things, but the mercy is a name for uh, the catching away. And then there's the the shining ones, uh, the nutsal, the catching away, the catching up, 
Uh, there's several things like that. I wanted to get your opinion too, because uh, you mentioned it and it just brought it to mind. I forgot to put it on the list, but uh, about the two witnesses, um, there there's a lot of different opinions about the two witnesses, but mo- most people think that it's either uh, Moses and Elijah or Enoch and Elijah. And I wanted to get mm-hmm. your opinion on it because when we look at, for, for a long time, I thought, okay, Enoch and Elijah, because it looks like they were raptured, so maybe they're uh, the two witnesses, you know, those two seem to stand out. But the more I thought about it, I thought if if they got raptured, would that mean that they got their new bodies? Meaning how could they die? You know, how could they die again? So the, if they're in their glorified bodies, that, that didn't make sense. Or could it be that God just kind of transported them through time and, you know, dropped them, dropped them there in the future. Or is, is there anything in the scrolls or in, in uh, the ancient church fathers or maybe something even that we just missed in scripture? Is there anything that can explain who the two witnesses are? What, what, what's your opinion? Um, there's some texts that, that say Enoch and Elijah or Moses and Elijah, and those don't seem to be, I mean, it seems like it's part of someone's sermon and you're not sure who it is. And so, yeah, there's a few texts like that, but I wouldn't consider them too reliable. You know, or they turn around and something really weird, like the Antichrist appears and he's got five heads, and you know, something like that. So there's a lot of weird texts like that. But as far as basic church fathers, um, they seem to indicate that it's uh, Elijah, uh, the Elijah that was back then that was caught up. So his his uh, catching away is different than the complete glorification, I guess, if he comes back and dies, if they're correct. And I think what's interesting about that is, um, it, first off, you've got Elijah uh, and, and Enoch being raptured, so to speak, and then Moses simply disappearing and the, the body is, is taken, which may or may not be the same thing. Um, so I, I think it's more important rather than looking at who they are as to what they are and when they do what they do. Like we're told that the whole thing ends between, I think it's the first and second wall or the second and third wall. And that's inside of one of the, the, uh, trumpets. So you can begin to figure out who, I mean, where they do their work and the exact amount of time it takes. And you can probably figure out it's a start and stopping on a, on a Moedim actually. So there's a lot of interesting things about it, but a lot of times we get caught up with that. And again, we might start arguing on who we think it is. And it's very, it could very easily be two guys, you know, that are just raised up in the spirit and power of Elijah. Jesus said that uh, John the Baptist was raised in the spirit and power of Elijah. And if they would have accepted him as such, he would have helped him usher in the kingdom. But of course, it didn't happen. And so um, I, what I, I think is interesting, though, is their expectations, because when you look in the first chapters of John and the Pharisees come to, to John the Baptist and they say, are you the Christ? No. Are you Elijah come again in the flesh? No, I'm not an 800 year old man. <laughs> oh, OK, well, are you this? No. Well, then why should we even pay attention to you? I'm the voice crying in the wilderness. You know, and so they go back and like, we forgot that prophecy. We better go look at it. So it's interesting to see how they look at things. So I think it's important to look at what they do rather than who they are. I don't really have an opinion for sure uh, who they are, but it would be really interesting to 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 see them. Yeah, I agree, and I, I'm with you too. I I think that that's one of the things that you know we we it, it's kind of unknowable at this point. And uh, I I and I'm I'm with you. I think probably the most likely scenario is it's two new guys. You, you know. Uh, maybe remnants of the Essenes or something, but uh, although they would have to be, they they would have had to, if they're just two regular guys, they would have had to be like recent converts because they didn't get caught up in the rapture for some reason. If it, so, if that's the case, so that would be interesting to find out too. Lot, yeah, lots of lots of different possibilities with that. First uh, Thessalonians four through five, uh, four. 15 through 17. Uh, this is one of the most famous like rapture passages, and it seems to give us, uh, this also seems to give us a timeline, so I can read that too for uh, people who don't have it. Um, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep, 
For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. And then the 18th verse, uh, verse 18 says, therefore comfort one another with these words. And that, that last verse to me for the longest time was always like, how can I comfort somebody with it when I don't understand it? You know, But it, it means yeah. that when Paul wrote it, the original audience, it, it seems like, would have totally understood you know, what he's saying, and it would have made sense to them. Um, so what exactly does it look like during the rapture? Because it says, the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds. So on one hand, caught up together sort of sounds like the dead and the alive will be raptured at the same time. But just before that, it sounds like the dead are raised first and sometime after that we will be. But then we also have Revelation uh, 20 that seems to say the resurrection comes in stages like what we talked about a minute ago, uh, one for believers and a second one for unbelievers after the thousand year reign. And that's in Revelation. Revelation 20. So going back to like the dead in Christ uh, will rise first, it, it seems like there's something more to that passage, some context, something to explain um, what what seems like odd wording on the surface. Is there some context that we're missing here or something in the original languages or something, some kind of idiom or, or something that can help us kind of make sense of what's being talked about here? Well, in that case, I think what it's basically saying is the dead in Christ are raised first, then we are raised or changed and caught up together with them. Um, but in, in another sense, like when we go to 1 uh, Corinthians 15, it talks about the entire procedure happening, happening in a twinkling of an eye. So technically, they go first and then we go second. But when it happens, the whole thing is like that. So I think that's basically what we're talking about. So there doesn't seem to be a contradiction. It's just basically saying that we don't get something that the other guys don't get. Right. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense, too. And and using that verse to kind of help fill in the blanks, too, because some people have said, you know, well, the, the dead rises first. That, that just means that when a Christian dies, it's not a soul sleep thing. They're not, like, waiting. They, they rise first when they die, but we who are alive and remain, we get caught up in this rapture thing. And, yeah, there have been, um, that in you know, years ago when I was coming back into, like, uh, Christianity— that verse uh, was one of the ones that kind of tripped me up because of that. I would say just in connection with 1 Thessalonians yeah. 4, um, 13 to 18 is the rapture passage, and everybody reads that and they kind of stop. Chapter 5, they think of it as, you know, it's another chapter, different subject, but it's really a continuation of this. And in chapter 5, he starts out by saying, concerning the times and seasons, you don't need that I write to you because you know about the day of the Lord. And so if you plug all that together, you can tell he's saying that the rapture happens. Comfort everybody with this because you know what happens before the day of the Lord. In context, it's pretty straightforward. It's still a little, I mean, you can argue it. And I think that's why he turns around later and writes Second Thessalonians to say, okay, let me, let me make it clear, you know, because I didn't really, I thought I made it clear, but not quite. There's a lot of people today who say that the pre-trib rapture was uh, started by Darby and was based on a vision that some girl had a couple hundred years ago. And it's weird that people still say that because it's so clearly been debunked uh, over and over again. But in case somebody is thinking that now and they haven't heard any of the debunking, um, what are some of the, and we've already talked a little bit about it, but what are some of the oldest references from the church fathers of a specifically pre-trib rapture? And where can we find those uh, who wrote what? How do we know that this wasn't started just a couple hundred years ago? Yeah, the, the whole concept with Darby, uh, Darby made it popular. And, and what's going on is you've got the first and second, third century Christians teaching uh, premillennialism. And I think everybody agrees on that. And there's actually several quotes from the early church fathers, uh, which, which uh, give you a pre-tribulational rapture concept. And then also a few from the scrolls. So that was common teaching, and people try to say, no, that didn't happen. But what happens is in the Middle Ages, or actually starting with the schism of Nepos, uh, the, the church kind of flipped and became amillennial. So that you have basically about a thousand years of time where the church just taught, no, that's symbolic of something else. 
but people don't realize that's the official church, which might be 80, 90 percent of everybody because they just follow what they're told. But there's always been people that have different opinions, probably pre, mid and post all the way through. People always have different opinions. You get to like the 14 and 15 and 1600s, and there are actually probably a good 30, 40, 50 uh, English puritanical uh, preachers, Puritan preachers uh, and others that were uh, believing in a pre-trib rapture. Uh, in, in the book, I wrote a book on uh, the pre-trib rapture, and I've got a lot of quotes of them in there. And so it continues, and then Darby basically makes the whole thing very popular. There's always the one guy that really wakes everybody up. Um, and like I say, we've all believed this, and everybody agrees that the early church fathers were at least premillennial. I think almost everybody agrees on that. But still, it wasn't a popular idea until you probably remember Hal Lindsey, late great planet Earth. Yeah. That just instantly woke everybody up. With this same thing in mind, I could probably say that this – the rapture concept, it was really started by Hal Lindsey, you know, and in, in reality, it kind of sort of was. He he made the, the whole thing um, popular again, brought it to everybody's attention. So Darby did that back in his day, too. And when you don't go further back, you you get confused. And that's why I've made my ministry the, the type of thing where I'll take all that, go back as far as we can. And then I'll turn around and start from the beginning with the old scrolls back back in the for even the pre-flood world, if possible, the few texts we have, and then go forward. And usually you can figure out what happened in the middle. And so bottom line is there are plenty of people that are pre-trib rapture. That doesn't mean that it's real. It just means that Darby didn't invent it. Neither did Hal Lindsey. Yeah, definitely. Uh, do you, and if if not, like I'm kind of putting you on the spot with this, and uh, like I don't have every quote that I write about memorized. So if not, it's totally fine. We can either way. We can direct people to your books. I know it's in there. But do you have any uh, just off the top of your head any examples or quotes uh, from those early days, from like the early church fathers or even the Dead Sea Scrolls that talk about specifically the pre-trib rapture? Yeah, I can bring some of those up. Let me um, find it here. Oh yeah, that'd be great. And yeah, while you're doing that, it's it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting topic too because there's still people that really hold to that idea that it was just made you know it was just invented a couple hundred years ago. And it it's funny because I see this with a, a lot of different ideas that they're easily debunked, but the people who want to believe that this isn't true or this is true, a lot of times they don't look into it to see if it really is. And I, I think that that's kind of what, what's spurred on this popularity of this Darby idea that that he invented it when clearly he didn't. Yeah, my, my professor always talked about that kind of a thing. And they said he said that once someone takes a position one way or the other on, on a subject, it's really hard for them to change position because it's kind of embarrassing. Yeah. You've went on a limb and said, I know it's this. And then there's some evidence that I was wrong. And, you know, it, it's really hard for people to do that. So usually the first thing that they hear and they say, I believe this, it's really hard to to change them back the other direction. I've met lots of people like that, and it's just one of those things. That's why I, I try to guard myself from, from being that way and for anybody else's benefit. But I'll try to say, like these quotes I'm going to give you, they, to me, they sure look like they're pre-trib. Now, if we find out they're really not, I'm not sure how you would do that. But I mean, if you could, then uh, apparently I was wrong. Right. You know, I'm not, I didn't write it. I'm just reading it. And to me, it looks like this. So I'm just bringing church father quotes, uh, Dead Sea Scroll quotes, uh, quotes in the Bible. Uh, maybe I'm putting them together wrong. That's for you guys to decide. I just want to give you the evidence. Uh, so, for instance, though, as far as pre-tribulationalists, uh, there was the Shepherd of Hermas, there was uh, Church Father Irenaeus, Hippolytus, uh, Victorinus, Cyprian, and Ephraim the Syrian are, are people that quoted that and were very, very clearly that. So here's a couple of quotes. This is from uh, the Shepherd of Hermas, and basically this is a guy that had a dream. It's not canonical. The Church Fathers say this was a very righteous man. The dream seems to be legit, and you know, they liked it, they quoted it, but it's not to be added to scripture. Um, but the point is, it doesn't really matter if someone taught a pre-trib rapture back then, somebody taught it. 
So, and that's what we're getting at. Um, so he has this dream about a lady and this great tribulation, and the lady is the, is the church or the believers, he's told later. He says, go therefore and de- do and declare to the elect of the Lord his mighty deeds and say to them, the beast that you saw is the, is the great tribulation which is to come. And of course, they all understand that's that time of Jacob's trouble. Many of them have talked about that. It happens right before the second coming, whenever that is. So, But this is the great tribulation. So in this dream, there's this beast, which is the great tribulation. If you therefore prepare yourselves and will, with your whole heart, turn to the Lord in repentance, you will be able to escape it. So these people can escape the tribulation, okay? If your heart is pure and blameless. The golden door in the dream stands for those who have escaped from this world. Now, this is the symbol of the great tribulation to come, but if you are willing, it shall be nothing to you. So really, really interesting. So that's one quote. Here's one quote from, I'll just maybe do one from each of these, but here's Irenaeus. This is in his book Against Heresies. He's writing against all the weird cults, and some of them are are apocalyptic, so he's trying to pull everything together. Against Heresies 529. He says, when at the end, he's talking about revelation and the things that happen at the end, the church will be suddenly caught up from this. And then it was said, there will be a great tribulation such as not been from the beginning nor ever will be. So that's actually a quote for Matthew. So he's saying, again, it's just his opinion, or he was taught this by the apostles or somebody, but it's his opinion that the church is caught up before that great tribulation part. Now, I know there's an argument for a great tribulation being the second half and not the whole, and we can see that in some of the quotes, too, that the reason why I'm a pre-trib and not a pre- and or mid-trib person. And so there's a couple of quotes from Hippolytus. Um, here's one that's uh, from Victor, and this this goes back to uh, the quote in Second Thessalonians 2 when it says, uh, uh, the restrainer restrains until he is taken out of the midst. And that's what it actually says in Greek. King James is just a little bit different. But we found out that out of the midst is actually an ancient idiom. And I can show you that too from Enoch and a few other texts. And it basically means a rapture. When Enoch was raptured, according to the book of Enoch found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it talks about he was taken out of the midst, meaning taken away from earth. Okay, And so it becomes an idiom for a rapture, and Paul is using it when the restrainer, which is the church uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, is raptured or taken out of the midst, then that stuff starts. And so here's another one. Victor writes a commentary on the book of Revelation. It's the oldest commentary we have. It's dated about 240 A.D. Wow. And he says this. He's he's quoting Revelation 15.1, and now this is in the second half. And he's talking about all of the, the wrath that's coming through this. And he quotes Revelation 15, 1, I saw another great and wonderful sign, seven angels having the seven last plagues. For in them, the wrath of God is complete. Okay, and so he quotes that. Then he makes this comment about it. Um, and this will be in the last time when the church shall have already gone out of the midst. So by the time you get to the second half of the tribulation, the church is already raptured. Wow. Okay, so that's one, that's one cool point. The other cool point for that quote is that the church going is out of the midst, just like Enoch went out of the midst. So he's actually quoting or referring to 2 Thessalonians 2, seven. So if Enoch uses that, he uses that. We understand it's an idiom. And Paul says that the restrainer has to go when he comes out of the midst. That's the church rapture. So after the rapture, that's when the Antichrist is revealed. And we know from Daniel, the revealing of the Antichrist is when he confirms the covenant for that last week. So that makes it a pre-trib, not a mid-trib. So this is just one line of reasoning that is pretty clear, but that's Victor. Cyprian says this in uh, Treatises of Trip, uh, Cyprian 21. Uh, he wrote a whole lot of, of text. But anyway, when the terrible things have begun, focusing on the tribulation period, and we know that still more terrible things are imminent, we'll regard it as a great advantage to depart from it as quickly as possible. Do you not give thanks to God? Don't congratulate yourself, 
but by an early departure, you will be taken away and delivered from the the disasters that are imminent when he snatches us hence. And so that's, again, another example of uh, these bad things start to happen. Don't think that you're going to do anything about it or that you're going to make it through. And it's not for your benefit, which is the same thing that Enoch says. There's a specific reason, but you will be snatched out of it. So thank the Lord for that. Here's Ephraim the Syrian. Uh, now, one of the things about this, he writes a uh, book called On the Last Times. And people say, well, this is a fake work because it's called Pseudo Ephraim. And I just want to make that clear. The reason why we call it Pseudo Ephraim is because we're not sure that Ephraim wrote it. There's two church fathers that say that this text was written by Ephraim the Syrian. One church father says it was written by Isidore of Seville. If it was the other way around, we'd say it's Pseudo Isidorian, you know, because it's probably one of the two guys, but there's a difference of opinion. But again, for our purposes, it doesn't really matter. This is a Christian who wrote a ton of different documents and commentaries on, on the scriptures. And in his book, On the Last Times, in chapter 2, he says, All of the saints of the elect of the Lord will be gathered together before the tribulation, which is about to come, and they will be taken to the Lord. So that's a pre-trib rapture. So that shows the church fathers, at least some of them, uh, taught a um, pre-trib rapture. Yeah, that's amazing. And and you mentioned the book of Enoch. And uh, so does that mean that the Essenes, because we know that that's at least 100 years before the time of Christ. But so would that mean that the Essenes, and also because they had this understanding of the ages, and the Zadok priest, they would have been dispensational pre-tribulation rapture believers? Yeah, you could definitely say they're pre, or excuse me, that they're dispensationalists. Now, we might divide differently, divide the dispensations differently, but the concept is the same. It's either covenantal or it's dispensational. And so their concept was that there are three main ages. There's an age of creation called the age of chaos. There's the age of Torah. And then there's also the age of grace. Those are the three ages where mankind just kind of does his own thing. And then there's a each one of those is supposed to last 2000 years. And uh, then there's a 1,000-year reign of Christ, which comes afterwards. So they believe that uh, completely. Now, we can argue whether that's really true or going to happen, but we're talking about what a denomination believes. And I don't think anybody should be able to say, no, I don't, I don't think Baptists believe in baptism. You know, it's like, no, they, be it right or wrong, that's what they believe. So they were dispensationalist in that time, and they talked about what happens at the end of the ages and how the ages change and the things like that. And they they talk about at the end of each age, there is a period of persecution that happens. And uh, in the last age, it was a 40-year period coming from when the time the Messiah died and started uh, the covenant of grace to when the temple was destroyed. And at that time period, the Jews had a chance to see what was going on and make a decision at the end of which the decision was made for them, if anybody hadn't accepted the Lord. And they talk about that 40-year period. We're going to have the same kind of thing at the end of our age, and they say it's going to be a seven-year period. Now, that's totally different than what Daniel says about our seven-year period. So they're they're believing all these things. And then the the other scripts talk about before that period uh, happens, which is called the time of Jacob's trouble, there's going to be a group of people Uh, that leave and come back. Just to let you know, in Enoch uh, chapter 70, verse 2, is where we get the the other quote of the out of the midst. Uh, It's talking about Enoch being taken up at that point. He was caught up on chariots of the Spirit and was taken out of their midst. So again, that's that idiom again. So the rapture, his rapture is being taken out of the midst. Victor says the church being taken out of the midst is the rapture. And then Paul uses the term about the restrainer. So, you know, it's not hard to pull those together in that respect. Um, In chapter 50, this is what it says in chapter 50 about why uh, the rapture happens. It says, in those days, a change will take place for the holy and the elect, and the light of days will abide upon them. So understand, these are already the holy and the elect. So they're believers. So you and me. So what kind of a change happens to us? We've already been born again, we have the Spirit, our attitudes have already been changed. So the change is when the light abides upon us, the shining, it's the same thing that Daniel mentioned. So that's the rapture, okay? So this change takes place on the righteous, 
glory and honor and true holiness on the day of tribulation on which the either evil will gather together against the sinners the righteous will overcome in the name of the lord of spirits he will cause the others to witness it that they may repent and cease from the works of their hands so the reason why there's a group of people that are a witness that nobody believes in are all of a sudden caught away is to let you know there's something real about this. And if that prophecy is real, so are the other ones. You've got a really limited amount of time to make a decision. And so that's what's going on. One of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, in the Ezra Apocalypse, there's several things that talk about it. And here's just a couple of quotes. Everyone who survives these things, again, talking about the tribulation, so if you if you make it through the tribulation, you, evidently you become a believer and you don't get killed. Everyone who survives these things, like I have told you, will escape and see my deliverance at the end of the world. Then the men who have been taken up, men plural, not just the two witnesses, but men who have been taken up, who have not tasted death since their birth. The two witnesses, you know, no matter how you look at it, come back and they die. Right. And then they're resurrected and raptured. So we're not talking about the two witnesses, but there's a group of people. And incidentally, men means mankind. It's men and women both. You only say woman when you're talking about a specific woman or a group of only women. So it's not derogatory. It's holding women very special. But this group of people, in other words, men, mankind, who have been taken up, who have not tasted death since their birth, will see it. Then the heart of the inhabitants of the earth will be transformed and changed. So there's several other things about uh, these group of people that come back with him are the ones that were caught up before the tribulation started. They're the ones that are called the bride. And that's actually what it says in the scroll. So it's pretty interesting to, hmm, I wonder where, that, maybe that's where Paul got it. No, Paul got it from the Holy Spirit. But there's several quotes like that in there. But that's just a couple of them. I'll go ahead and stop at that point. But that shows you that the concepts are taught in the scrolls. The concepts are taught in the early church fathers, some of the medieval church fathers. And uh, Darby made it popular, how Lindsay made it popular. Uh, so it, we're, we're building a really strong case for this, I think. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that that's just like loads of information that you usually don't hear in like church settings and stuff like that. A lot of Christians, uh, I haven't been taught that. And it's it's amazing to have all that together in that resource. Um, before I continue, I do have more questions, but I, I, I meant to ask you before we uh, started recording, how much time do you have available? Do you still have some, some time or do you have to? Oh, you want. Okay, great. All right. Um, so, this is something that has just been phenomenal for me. You know, I mean, this this kind of, it brings me back to childhood. It brings me back to, like, my childhood excitement about, like, the rapture and prophecy and, uh, you know, all of that stuff. And I, I think a lot of people are, are kind of waking up to this as, as well. Why do you think that the belief in the pre-trib rapture seems to have been uh, sort of absent or, or, or not not as much emphasis from the time after the early church fathers until a bit before our time today? Uh, or has there always been like a remnant who believed in it? Or, or in other words, why hasn't this uh, have been so popular? Why hasn't this been so popular that it's all over Christian writings, you know, in, throughout history the same way that some other doctrinal points are? Yeah, there's an interesting story about that. There's a guy by the name of Eusebius of Caesarea, and he's called the father of church history. And the reason is because in 325, he put together a really, really good history from Christ, the start of Christ up to his time, what the church fathers did and who went to beware for the bishops and just stuff. And there were three church fathers that wrote history books after his time. Each one of them said, we're not even going to try to cover it. He did such a great job. We're going to start where he left off and go forward. So he's called the father of church history. And he records exactly what happened. And what's really interesting is um, basically everybody believed in a premillennial uh, concept. And there were Gnostics. Gnostics were the cults of their day. And Gnostics, uh, several of the Gnostic schools started teaching that you have to endure some bad things now, but when we get to heaven, so to speak, it'll be one big party. There will be uh, 
all the wine and all the food that you want, and we get like 70 virgins. That's what one of the teachings was. Huh. And I thought that's interesting. It's like that. That's probably where Islam got it. Right. 70 virgins. And they don't like wine necessarily, but they would go with that. So anyway, but the church fathers said, no, there's no way we can live a sinless life or try to live a sinless life, dedicate ourselves to the Lord, go to heaven and be rewarded by perpetual sin. <laughs> right. That does, no, that, that's not the proper interpretation, you know. <laughs> and so they, they really hit it hard that this is not right. And so some of the people started saying, well, maybe Revelation talking about the, per, you know, everything being perfect and all that is symbolic of something else. Okay. And so what had happened was that symbolic idea kept going because there's no way that could be real. Well, obviously the perpetual sex and, and drugs and all this stuff is not real, but we still do have a, uh, heaven is going to be perfect. It's not going to be messed up. So this continued, and what had happened was Eusebius recorded there was a bishop in Egypt who was named Nepos, and he caused what was called the schism of Nepos. And what had happened is he wrote a book similar to what I did about all, with the quotes from the church fathers, but he wrote a book, and it was called The Refutation of the Allegorists. You know, so in other words, these people are allegorizing, saying it doesn't really mean what it says. It's symbolic of something else. And he's writing this book to show how that's nonsense. First off, he's not Gnostic, and you, you were right by saying uh, Cherinthius and these guys were wrong, that Gnostic school is junk, but the scriptures are clear and they mean what they say. And so he writes this book to explain that, and here's the proof. Here's all the quotes and all this. It's a great work. Um, and then, but what had happened was somehow somebody started saying, this guy is turning Gnostic. He's losing his mind. He's a nut. And somehow it fosters more resentment, and the whole church basically flips into amillennialism. And the funny part is, Irenaeus ends his commentary on that part of history by saying that uh, um, the official teaching of the church is amillennialism, and the official teaching is that it always has been. What I've said should suffice. And then he just drops it and goes on because you want your book to get published. You don't want to go against the, you know, but it's amazing how he can say, yeah, the, the standard teaching is that's the way it is. And that's always been the way it is. Go read chapter two. <laughs> so, and that's the way Eusebius was great guy. But, uh, but that, that gives us the whole story of how things flipped. Now, no matter how it worked exactly, the point is we were pre-millennial, apparently pre-tribulational. Something happened and it flipped, and we have a record of when and a basic story of how. And so that continues for a long time. And I think you can see why it continues, because number one, we pick up the book of Revelation and we see towards the end there's going to be this harlot church, and it's going to be hor it's going to look Christian, but it's going to be horrible. Well, if the rapture was to happen right now, this is in the Middle Ages, somebody in the Middle Ages was going to say, wait a minute, if there's a pre-trib rapture and all that's real, and it happens like right now, who is the biggest Christian type church that exists? Ooh, that would be Rome. So you can see the Romans going, um, that's really symbolic of something else. There's nothing wrong with it. And, and they weren't demonic because it was like in the Middle Ages. But you don't want your people knowing that somehow this church, the one that you go to before Christ comes back, will be a seat of Satan. You're going to leave way before that. You're going to stop tithing. And, you know, and so the at, at the same time, they, they brought up something called uh, cessationism, which means the gift stopped. And that goes hand in hand with it, because if you say, well, obviously, this is satanic and it's real, or you're going against the church. Well, it's because I'm a prophet. Those don't exist anymore. We've proven that. You know, so if you go against the church, you're not a prophet. You're obviously demonic. And so the cessationism, the amillennialism, and the, the whole idea of uh, you, you would be better off not to read the Bible. You'll get yourself confused. Just leave it to the experts. That whole thing came together, and it stayed like that for about a thousand years. It's amazing. It's amazing too to think about the the state that the church is in now. You know, comparing to that, because we have cessationists today. Actually, the the church that I grew up in, even though they they um, they they didn't really teach prophecy, it was just something that I really 
enjoyed, and they, they would mention the rapture here and there, but they were totally cessationists. Like, they did not believe, they, they thought gifts of the, you know, tongues was like of the devil, and prophecy is fake, and like they, and modern day prophets and all that. Uh, so it's funny, but, you know, we, we get that today even, and uh, with the allegorizing, I mean, that's be, it seems like it's becoming more and more popular, you know, with preterism and amillennialism, amillennialism even today. And, and one thing that actually causes me to think the pre-trib rapture is right is what, one of the things that I look for isn't only just what is logical. Obviously, that's important too, but I look at the fruit as well. Like, what's the fruit that it produces? And right now, the attitude around some of the other views, and I know not everyone is like that. I actually have some really good friends that are, you know, partial preterists and, and things like that. And even though we don't agree, we, we get along great. And um, I, I have other friends who are like really into Puritan stuff and, you know, they're amillennials. And even though we don't agree, we get along great. We're brothers in the Lord. We're both going to heaven, you know, all that stuff. But just, uh, so not everyone is like this. And, you know, of course, there are people that could point to uh, one or two pre-tribbers that, that act like this too, but just kind of generally speaking, you know, not counting the outliers, just generally speaking, it seems like there's almost this air of like arrogance from the mind of, uh, you know, post-trib side or, or the pre-wrath or, pre, you know, mid-trib, whatever, uh, against like pre-tribbers. Like, like to believe that pre-trib, that's just outdated, that's stupid or thoughtless or even heretical. Uh, it, it sort of reminds me how the Galileans uh, were treated, these, you know, so-called like, they, they treated them like they were backwater hicks, you know, like we might say say in our day, but uh, it turns out they actually weren't stupid at all. They they were the ones that knew the truth. And it's part of what makes me think that maybe the, you know, probably the pre-trib is, is right based on how the other camps treat the pre-trib uh, position. So uh, do you do you think, especially since sometimes we, you know, see pride involved, though, you know, we're, we're not innocent either. You see it in, on all sides. But but do, do you think that the other rapture views are... Um, are just differences of, of opinions, or do you see them as like deceptions used by the enemy uh, to, to like m- maybe instill pride or something? Or are these just differences? Uh, in short, how, how serious is it that we believe in a pre-trib rapture? I don't think that it's going to make a difference in your salvation or even going in the rapture. Um, I think we need to first focus on what is very clear in Scripture, which is number one, we're supposed to, they're supposed to know that we're Christians because we love one another. And that's the great commandment to love one another. And we gently correct. I mean, even like in uh, Paul's case in first Corinthians five, the guy that sl- was sleeping with his father's wife, you know, and all of these other things, it's like gently correct them. Make sure he understands you don't do that. If he refuses, then you, he's no longer welcome. But that doesn't mean you hit him over the head that you cuss him or anything else. You're trying to get him to repent, and that's we tend to forget that kind of stuff. And you're not going to convert me by yelling at me and cussing at me and this kind of stuff. You might convert me by giving me some new evidence and get get me to actually think about it. Um, that, but actually, that's the only possible way of doing it. And I think that the Satan uses that all over. There's actually one old scroll that says that right before the Lord's coming, many people will be very argumentative about the second coming or oh, the, wow. the coming of the Lord. And so to me, that sounds like, uh, yeah, extreme argumentation on doctrine, but specifically the rapture. That's what I see. Um, because if I say, you know, like uh, Psalm 83 is already done and over with, in my opinion, or I don't think so, I think it's actually going to be in the near future, you would say, eh, yeah, I agree, I agree or disagree or whatever. But as soon as I say rapture, somehow, man, we're ready to fight. And that can't be. We yeah. cannot do that. We can't divide amongst ourselves. We will never uh, do what we're supposed to do in that re- respect. So we don't want to allow sin. You know, if you come to my Bible study drunk, I'm going to ask you to leave. And if you keep doing that, you're not going to be welcome. You know, it's just I, I didn't write the book. I'm just following the directions. If you want to repent to that and talk to me, hey, great, let's talk. Uh, because you're just the Lord loves you just as much as he does me, but we still can't do things like that. But also, we're not supposed to divide over doctrine. And I think, you know, when Paul says a heretic reject, if you look careful at that, that verse, and the word heretic is somebody who's divisive. So I can say, you know, I'm a, I'm a pre-tribber, and you maybe you're a post. And if we get along, we get along. But no matter what it is we're talking about, when I get divisive about it, that's a problem. 
And again, that's that's bringing up that perpetual hatred again, which is how the apostasy starts. And it's interesting that, that according to the scrolls, it was the exact same way the last time that the apostasy started. It wasn't so much like one major bone of contention between Pharisees and Sadducees is where the altar of incense sets in the tabernacle. Who cares? <laughs> I mean, if you're a Pharisee, set it where you want. If God kills you, you, you were wrong. <laughs> if I set it over here and God doesn't kill either one of us, he probably doesn't care either. So we're brothers, right? Why just, you know, whoever's leading it, you make your decision and, and, and let's do stuff and see what happens. I would be very scared. You know, I would come to you and say, I'm scared that you might get yourself in trouble for moving the furniture around in the, in the holy place. Um, but it's like they got to the point they did. Uh, I'm ruling God speaking through me. If you don't agree to this, I'm going to have to have you executed. You know, just like Zechariah killing him at, at the altar. My goodness. You know, but stuff like that happens. And it's it, it doesn't we tend to forget about God being in control. We're just supposed to do what we're told. We're not supposed to do that kind of stuff. One of the most amazing examples, I think, of this in the book of Gad the seer, there's this text where a uh, Moabite comes to him and he likes this girl. So he wants to fully convert to Judaism so he can marry the girl. And David said, no, the Lord doesn't want your people. It's forbidden in Deuteronomy. No Moabite can ever be made a part of the congregation. You and I are brothers. He acknowledged that he's saved. We're going to see, spend eternity together, but you can't convert to Judaism. It's forbidden. And he comes up with this great argument. He says, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Your grandmother was a Moabitess. So how does that work? You're king of Israel. If she could do it, I'd be able to do it. So, you know, and the amazing thing about it is David's attitude. He doesn't say, well, we'll see if we can get a ruling and get the Sanhedrin to be favorable to you. And, you know, we'll decide. Heck with the Sanhedrin. His attitude is he, he he's like, you know, you're right. That's a good question. You come with me. Where are we going? To Sanhedrin? No, that's a bunch of guys. No, I'm going to grab the Urim and Thummim. You're going to come with me. We're going to ask. Who? God. He's the only one that matters. We're going to, you could, yeah, it doesn't say you can't come in and ask. It says you can't be a part of the congregation. So let's be specific now. Let's go ask. And so that attitude is amazing. That's what we should have. Um, I'm not your teacher. I'm not your mom. I can't tell you to do something. Uh, I can just simply say, if you're going to do something I think is wrong, I'm not going to let you come to my, to church. And that's the way we should do it. We should really be guarding against this apostasy beginnings, this uh, this hatred. Yeah, absolutely. I, I 100% agree. You have a book on the rapture. I think it's actually just called The Rapture, but you have an excellent book written on this topic with all these references uh, that we've talked about. Can you tell people um, where you know a little bit about the book, where they can get it, and also where they can follow you online and find your show and things like that? Yeah, well, we start off talking about, and, and it's just the idea of understanding the rapture. So we show the premillennial concept, the seven-year period, touch on pre, mid, and post, and then show you from scriptures, from the early church fathers, from the Dead Sea Scrolls, how everybody interpreted them. And then in the back, there's actually some arguments if if, um, if you are post or mid-trib, some questions to ask them, like, well, if that if your position is true, how do you explain this? And it usually, you know, makes them stop and think. So we put all that together, and it... it um, we just wanted to pull all that information together so we can have it to everyone. And it's called the, the rapture. And it's, if, if you, uh, you can look all these up on, on, uh, Amazon. That's where I sell my books mainly, but you can go to biblefacts.org and there's a store there. They're simply links where you click on them and you go buy them from Amazon. So that way, you know, it's a legitimate company and you, you know, you're not going to be out of any money or anything. So um, biblefacts.org, the store, uh, or just look me up on, um, Amazon. Excellent. And is that where people can also, uh, watch your, your live streams? Yes. You can go to the Bible facts website on the front page. There will be a, a, um, a link or not a link, but actually an embed. So whenever I'm live on YouTube, it should be there. And if YouTube ever decides I can't do that, I could, do Twitch or something else, and there are buttons there to click on it. So if you're watching me on YouTube and one day I just don't show up, maybe I'm sick or something, but just go to the website and see if I'm 
or if I am, then something else happened. But we'll always be broadcasting from somewhere. And uh, on YouTube, if people want to support your ministry, there's a join button as well with different membership tiers, which um, I actually tried to join, but for some reason it, it kept saying that there was a problem with PayPal. And so I would go to PayPal and there was, I, I, it wasn't telling me there was any issue. So I'm still trying to work that out. But for most people, uh, tell people how they can support you through YouTube with that join button and what, what those tiers are. Yeah, the website, there's a link to PayPal and that should work. Um, on YouTube, they have a membership. And so if uh, there's three tiers, like $5, $10, I think $20. And so the first tier, you get in the members only chat on Monday nights. And like the top tier, um, you would get uh, whenever we come out with a free book, you'd get the PDF of it. And so just things to kind of, kind of give back and uh, as a thanks for supporting the ministry. Excellent. Well, to my audience, I highly suggest everybody go do that. Uh, check out Dr. Johnson's work. Check out his website, his books, and his YouTube videos. I'm telling you, I'm obsessed with them, so I know you'll like them too. I'm trying to decide if I want to save this for members only, because we do got to head into members only. And I wanted to ask you about the wedding festivals and the rapture and a, a, a the movie by the Brent Millers, our mutual friends, um, before the wrath. I'm gonna I'm gonna save that for members only uh, because I don't want YouTube to delete things, and they've gotten in the nasty habit of doing that. So for everybody watching, if uh, if you want to see the rest of this interview, we got a lot more to talk about. We got viewer questions. Uh, we're gonna talk about the the marriage festival. If that points to the rapture, we're gonna talk about where we are on the prophetic timeline right now. What types of things should we be looking for and expect in our near future? Uh, and like I said, we have viewer questions uh, to get to as well. So if you want all of that, head on over to dailyrenegade.com and get a membership. And that helps us be able to have control over our own content so we can be sure that our videos won't get deleted and you, you can enjoy them uh, there and, and learn from them without YouTube getting in the way and telling you that you can't. So head on over to dailyrenegade.com right now. Uh, everybody viewing for free. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Members, hang on the line. Everyone else, until next time, take care and God bless.